Well, good afternoon, all the hundred children. We glad, glad that hundred children to join me today for this year, twenty six episode of Zooming In on Sustainability. This year, the Queen Quet Head Fund, the body of the Gullah Geechee Nation. I'm so glad that 100 children to join me one more again. Yeah. Oh, and we have to say happy holidays to all the 100 children because we moving into that time of air. So you know what we do wrong here. We always open this year broadcast and things like that to pay tribute and homage to we ancestors right here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, Punisha, Sea Islands, and things like that. And it did, especially when pay a tribute to all of them, we're going to fight for. We land, we water, and things like that. We know it's the water bring me, the water right check we well. So if this your thing ain't healthy, we not healthy neither. So we make a water, water make a we. So we have a give thanks for all we ancestors who been a hold them down, been a stand up, a speak out for justice, but make sure that we would have a place where we could live healthy and we could be free. So let we take a moment of silence. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. For all the hundred children with day of the day and thing like that, we want to say thank you, thank you, and thing like that. But join we right here for zooming in for sustainability. Oh, it's been a bless up air to crack my teeth with plenty of these your children. We're part of this your thing we call the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank. Now, right here, the Gullah Geechee Nation of Gwine from North Kakalaki all the way down Florida. And we did right here in Atlantic. So, plenty of reason why we the crack me teeth of sustainability for truth. But let me throw this thing down so that Hunter can overstand upon and crack your teeth like this shell like we do. So if you don't speak our language, I want to speak in a language that most of y'all around the world either overstand or your translation devices can handle. So I'm Queen Quet. I'm the chiefest and head of state for the Gullah Geechee Nation. I'm the founder of the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition. And I'm also the visionary behind the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank. Now, a central part of the work of the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank is to be proactive. So we try to act upon the issue ahead of time, not wait until it's something that we have to do cleanup of. Those of you who are joining us today live, who are part of the EJ community, the environmental justice community, you are very accustomed to that word about cleanup. You're very accustomed to this word remediation. All right. Now, if we have to remediate or clean up, that means damage or harm has already been done. So whether we are talking about after a hurricane comes in and on the Sea Islands, we're in a hurricane zone. So that's something we are extraordinarily familiar with. And we are so happy that hurricane season 2020 has officially ended, even though they always let you know now storms could still crop up out there in the Atlantic. But the fact of the matter is the likelihood that it would become a full blown, pun intended, type of tropical storm or hurricane that would be harmful to us is not as likely. But then again, who thought it would be likely that all of us would sit at home and become Jetsons and actually talk to each other this way this year, right? So anything is possible. So with that statement, we have to think that way in terms of being environmental actors, people who are actually going to be proactively engaged in presenting healthy communities to the next generation. So part of that is not only moving into renewable energy sources like solar power and such as we continue to go forward and try and greening the world and dealing with what we call the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but that word again, sustain comes in. So how do you sustain cultural heritage and community even as you start to do these futuristic things, even as you start to use some modern things in your world that didn't exist through your culture? Well, sometimes it's just us who are thinking of that, about cultural heritage, about communities, and how there are impacts, whether they're positive or negative, there are always impacts on the communities based on the literal environment that those communities are in, and based on the political climate of who's controlling what legislation will allow certain things to be built certain places, allow certain industries to happen and those industries to do things that may be extractive in one place out of water or land that could be negatively impactful in another place and on the communities living there. So we end up 
with environmental justice coming into the fray because people have to then take an action that brings about justice and now equity and equality so that one community can't say, well, don't put it in my backyard, but you can put it across there in somebody else's backyard. Or don't put it here because it'll block my golf course and my villa view, but take it a little bit down the creek shore so this county still gets the tax base from this polluter, but we don't have to see it. Take it over there where the other folks are, which tend to be people who don't have the same kind of money. So if they don't have the same kind of money, sometimes they can't buy their way into the political system. So then you have an injustice in one community that's financially beneficial to another community. And that's not just. So then we end up having to fight for justice. And sometimes it's just us, people with my kind of melanated skin, people of color, people who are black, people who are indigenous as y'all are now calling us, BIPOC folk. We are usually the ones that I see in the environmental justice movement. We're usually the ones that I see having to go and then do testimonies about how many people in our families and communities have died because of pollutants that are in those communities, because nobody remediated after you shut the factory down because of a protest, but then all the poisons are still there seeping into the ground, can't do agriculture, seeping into the water, gets in people's lungs and their bodies as they use that water to cook with, to bathe with, the other things like this. Even in some communities, some of y'all may have seen this on YouTube, they turn their water on and can light a match and they, and they catch on fire right there the water speaking. So these are all injustices right here in South Carolina, Aiken, South Carolina, some other communities, they found that we have situations that are similar to Flint, Michigan. And that's not making the national news. It's not making the international news because they kind of do each community like you get one story. You get one Aaron Brockovich movie. You get one Flint, Michigan, and we gonna ride that story. Like it's only in that one place. And they wanna convince you of that so that when someone comes along with the line, we're gonna give y'all jobs. You'll accept those minimum wage jobs that usually don't have the medical benefits to go with it that then will pollute your community. So now do you want the dollar? You'll die for the dollar? Or do you want to sustain your body, your community, your health, and that environment? So as I said earlier, we can pass it on to the next generation. So today must be environmental justice day for me because I did a class early at the University of Minnesota, worked with a group of young scholars who this is a focus and an interest of theirs. They're doing everything from community garden work to trying to help resource communities various things, working in agriculture and wanting to know what does it take to do this work. So I thought it not robbery to invite one of my former students who is now a doctor at the University at Auburn University, who is also a member of the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank, to come here to share some perspectives from the other side, as well as we can share some perspectives as collaborators and sometimes folks call us co-conspirators in this work for environmental justice. He has been arrested numerous times with someone who many of you know is a champion in the United States for environmental justice and for the so-called poor communities and just meaning those who are wealth challenged communities, those who do not have the finances. I clear that up because in my community, it's only if your spirit is lacking that you poor, all right? That you are a poor person, all right? So definitely Reverend Barber has led the charge. He has made the call for people to stand up for us to have a new Poor People's Campaign. And here's one of the people that I know out of North Kakalaki. He didn't grow up right there and think like a daddy. But then he go on Florida. Then from Florida, he ain't going all the way down Bama. So he down there bamming things up. Dr. Ryan Thompson, peace and blessings. Welcome to Zooming In on Sustainability. How hundred to do, Ryan? 
Greetings, Queen. Things are well. Uh, I really appreciate you inviting me on today. I'm so happy to see you again. It has been a little while. The last time we saw each other, there was no pandemic, right? <laughs> we had that opportunity at the Coastal Cultures Conference and I treasure seeing those pictures and the videos because we were all together, no mask, standing around, sharing in a circle. So it seems like it's been forever, but it was really earlier this year. So I know since that time, you've taken a journey that's been really interesting. So I want to start people back before you got down there where you are, and then let's move forward. Let's talk about this. Everybody I know is kind of shocked when you probably came on screen, especially after I said that you were from North Carolina. Tell the folks what part of North Carolina you're from and why being from there did you, looking like you're looking, decide to get involved with environmental justice issues? So I, I was raised in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, for people not familiar, it's a, a Southern coastal city right on the border with South Carolina. It is a part of the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Uh, and, and being raised there, I, I've, I've seen a lot of inequality, not only social, but environmental. Uh, the Cape Fear River, for people who aren't familiar, has been poisoned multiple times by chemors and their, their numerous subsidiaries with something called Gen X, which is a, a form of PFAS, a forever chemical. And it hit my hometown so hard that everyone I knew was showering with bottled water. They wouldn't turn on the spigot. We were, we were living in fear and we still do. As it turns out, Gen X is still in the water supply. Uh, Aaron Brockovich even moved to Wilmington to try and take this on. Funny you bring that name up. Uh, but in doing so, I went away to NC State and uh, learned that this environmental struggle is so much greater than just my little hometown. In, in North Carolina, you're talking about coal ash, uh, large, large dumping in the rivers, whether it be swine lagoons or, or these, these heavy chemicals. So we saw a, a real gross form of inequality. And we oftentimes found, uh, as Robert Bullard, uh, the father of environmental justice likes to say, uh, some people had the wrong complexion for protection. Mm. Now, I lived in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I, I'm from that mixed race background. And getting to see that working class exposure really put me on the course to where I am today. That's really serious right there, what you just said. Uh, I love that quote that you just said. It's awesome. Now, this is the thing. Now, you mentioned being growing up in a community with people that were mixed race. So are you saying they were biracial? Or are you saying that the whites and the blacks live together in that community? Or were they people that, you know, how, how do you mean when you say define mixed race for me? And then tell me, but even looking like you do, you could have done anything else, even though all this was going on with the communities that couldn't afford to be protected. You could have done something else. You could have turned your head. You could have went off to college and did something else. Why do this? Why care? So uh, I didn't go to the rural school out at Laney where Michael Jordan went. I didn't go to the rich school. Uh, Ashley, I, I went to the to the more middle. Um, and it was, it was black part of town and white part of town kind of meeting where I lived. It was uh, mixed income, but also... Uh, that was the first place I met someone who had a, a Gullah accent and started to learn about Gullah Geechee culture. So that was my first exposure, actually. Middle school into high school, had a few friends uh, who had that thick accent that I never quite understood. But uh, I remember my dad waking up at night screaming because his skin was, was itching like he was on fire. And that's what Gen X does to you. I have it in my body as well. It's on my legs. Uh, it haunts me at night. I can't get rid of it. This forever chemical will be, will be with me till the day I die. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't right that I, I got to have the opportunities to go away. Although I was a first generation to go to college, these issues aren't going to go away just because I was able to move out of town. Mm -hmm. And we see this type of, type of NIMBY, the good get out. Oh, well, you move out of the polluted neighborhood. That's just what you do. But my parents couldn't, my neighbors couldn't, my Gullah Geechee friends couldn't. Right. So this struggle not only hit home, it it is my home. Right. And there's nowhere I can run that it's going to go away because those chemicals are with me forever. So it put me on a different trajectory. And when I got to college, I changed my major uh, from actually art to uh, sociology and political science. I wanted to do something to give back. And it was that kind of trajectory that put me on the, I started working for Greenpeace. I got a job with them. I became an earth firster, uh, started doing all these different types of environmental activism, uh, tar sands protests. Um, and, and I got myself a nice little record in doing so. 
but it, it's interesting because being white, that's an accolade I have. The record's not a burden. It's, a, it's actually enabled me to go on into this field. So there is a lot of privilege in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's serious. And at least you decided to use your privilege to leverage it in ways that would not just help your family personally, but then help that whole community. Like you said, where there are Black people, there's Gullah Geechee people, there's white people, and they all get helped by you addressing the issue instead of running from the issue or thinking you could outrun the issue. But like you just brought up, and here we go, another Gullah Geechee, Teddy Pendergrass said, you can't hide from yourself no matter where you go. There you are. So like you said, this chemical is still with you. So even if you had moved somewhere else of so-called affluence using your privilege, still wouldn't have mattered because it's still there. And I think that's the thing is the forever chemical is a thing that we need to get banned forever. And we need to forever emboss in people's minds that these impacts, the things that people have lived through, these are real experiences and they are forever with us. But we have to forever be diligent to do something to counteract it so that the next generation doesn't have to do that. Like you said, wake up with nightmares, wake up with your skin itching, um, go to another funeral you know, keep sitting by somebody's bedside at the hospital because they're there with asthma attacks. They're there because they have eczema now because of these things, you know, the numerous, there's so many things that we've learned, especially in our work with the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank and working with MUSC, the Medical University of South Carolina, who study these types of chemicals in the waterways, in the air, in all of these things, but especially in the water. And you know, here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, I mean, what we gonna do if we don't talk about water, right? The water to bring we, the water gonna take we back. And so it is critical that we recognize that these are not things that happen and then, okay, they clean up the area and then everybody's fine. No, it's forever with you. So how do you run from it? You can't, you can't. So the best thing is to be actively engaged and actively involved. So it's wonderful that you did make that decision. Well, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to get engaged. I remember when we first met, you showed up at our conference and you showed up bearing gifts, uh, bringing buttons, uh, just like an activist, you bring buttons, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that you would actually handmade. So I knew that was part of that Carolina thing, you know, making, doing stuff with your hands. But you have put your hands to the plow, as we say here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, in terms of getting through a very complex issue in regard to how the political scheme of things go when we start talking about the environment and environmental justice. And I know you have some stuff that you brought with us because y'all university people, you know, y'all want to do your little PowerPoints and stuff, even though my thing is power to the people. Um, you know, y'all want to bring your little PowerPoints. So I know you brought some things to share with us today, but kind of give us a preface as to where you are now in this journey and what it is you want to share with the audience. So, I see a lot of people are uh, sad and down. My students are as well with COVID. We're socially distant. It's a hard time. Uh, I'm oftentimes reminded of, of something my mom said a few months ago where she said, oh, they're mandating masks, which is great because everyone's afraid of the air, but I'm more afraid of the water. Mm -hmm. And that fear, I think, is very persistent in these communities that have to bear these burdens, the front lines. Mm -hmm. and, and with the, the Trump administration rolling back and the mass exodus out of the EPA, especially the Environmental Justice Office, Mustafa right. Ali and them. These, right. these big names, these champions that we finally got into power had a, a mass departure. Exactly. They and left, that, they jump, when you talk about the water, they jump ship like rats do when the ship is going down, <laughs> you know? They saw what was coming. They knew what, they knew what tomorrow was gonna bring. And sure enough, we see this with the Clean Water Act. See, it's been, it's been gutted, it's been, left as a shell of what it once was. Same with the Clean Air Act and these uh, new opportunities for polluters to get away with things that are honestly something I don't even think the original founders of the EPA uh, had in mind as possibly coming back around 30, 40 years later. And, and during these four years, I think that there's been a, a lot of reflection within the environmental justice movement and the academic wing. Mm -hmm. um, new ideas coming about that I find personally exciting. Words we didn't have five, 10 years ago. And these new popularized ideas, I think, have done a lot. Uh, now with the new administration coming in and the possibility of putting the EJ office and the EPA back in power, right. we, see, we see so many new ideas that now have a, 
their first shot at getting on the getting on the docket, being legislated, being pushed out, and and new opportunities to really protect these frontline communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's that's where I'm looking for for kind of the silver lining, the new the new generations brought new ideas, and that's what I'm excited about. And I'm excited with you because many people who watch Gullah Geechee TV and y'all can definitely subscribe for free. Just go to gullahgeechee.tv and Gullah is G-U-L-L-A-H and Geechee is G-E-E-C-H-E-E. -E -E. Ain't in no I and Geechee for the week. GullahGeechee.tv. Subscribe for free because this broadcast will be there also after this for you to watch it, share it with others in other communities. But many of you who watch Zooming In on Sustainability and you already subscribe to the channel, you saw me recently sit down to help with the unveiling of the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act. So there are all of these 30 by 30 plans as well going on in states, going on in DC, to be able to do the things that the United Nations had already stated we should be doing globally as part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So now people are doing this 30 by 30. So if you see 30 by 30, this is something I'm hopeful for because what they're trying to do is say, you need to conserve 30% of the water 30% of the land in these governmental entities, we call municipalities and states and so forth, so that you will be able to protect it even from the incoming climate change dynamics. So having that coupled with the new EPA, God willing, that the US will have, the new folks who will be coming in that have a mind for science, who realize that all of these things do have an impact and science is a real thing, okay? That the environment is something that needs to be as protected as the people need to be protected. You know, we wanna bear arms, that's one form of protection, but what do we do about the environment? So this is great, I'm with you feeling positive that we are going to bring about some new change. And I told people, don't look at this 2020 as such a bad year. It has actually caused a shift. That shift is still underway. And it is a global shift. And it includes the shift of power. It includes the shift of spiritual energy. And the last shall be the first. So y'all need to be thinking along those lines and being active and getting actively involved. So you ain't over. Now's your time get involved. Like James Brown said, get up, get involved, get into it. All right. So that's what we need you to do. So let's go ahead and get into the goodies that you brought us today, Dr. Thompson. I want to see what you've been up to. You always have some good goodies. Now he is a geek like I am. All right, I'm a computer scientist and mathematician, so we tend to get together and talk about what we're geeking out on, different things that he has created. So I want to see what he put together today. Go ahead, Dr. Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Queen. That was uh, so kind. And, and so jumping, jumping into this, uh, I use this classical uh, kind of famous image of, of what environmental justice represents. I am at an ag school in rural sociology, so I'm oftentimes focused on those small towns those coastal communities, the black belt places that are oftentimes thought of after the fact. And, and in doing so, I'm gonna, like I said, lead with the things that I'm really excited about. And so uh, the topics I'll just br briefly jump through and Queen, please feel free to jump in at any time, especially uh, towards the later ones. Uh, defining environmental justice, I wanna give ground root, uh, some kind of basis or a home base for, for people who might not be as familiar. Nixon's slow violence. Mm -hmm. The rise of green criminology, mm -hmm. Taylor's environmental privilege, uh, Queen Quet, your your concept of destruction. Uh, as you know, I am a huge fan. I never uh, thought I'd see the day that I'd be in a list with Nixon, though. I must tell you that now. Not not <laughs> not Richard Nixon. Uh, this is a this is actually a literary scholar, but I'll, okay. I'll get into him in a minute. <laughs> in a minute. Uh, <laughs> I should I should have clarified. Yeah, please do here. <laughs> <laughs> because people know I like to talk the peace sign, but we ain't talking about that today. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, no. Rob, Rob Nixon out of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, completely yeah. different character. Yeah. And so I jump into these here and I was, I was raised in North Carolina. So my upbringing, uh, like Queen, Queen mentioned, was Moral Monday, Reverend Barber, Poor People's Campaign, sit-ins, yes. uh, Greenpeace slowly bringing me into these things. And I, I look back and I'm so impressed by what was accomplished on Earth Day, the largest protest of its type up until that point, back in 1970. 
but it's largely been whitewashed. The, the way that we understand it, it, it prioritized things like recycling and not like pollution dumping and things like this. So, so going back, I think we need to re-examine environmental history and how we understand these things because the Gullah Geechee have been fighting these things for, for decades, long before the first Earth Day. And yet it's not oftentimes contained within the narrative of, of environmentalism. Right. And so I, I go back to Afton Warren County where uh, Buck Ward of Ward Transformer Company dumped thousands and thousands of gallons of PCB forever chemicals along the highway in, in Warren County. Mm. And then the governor came in and said, oh, we're gonna put it all in the black rural community of Afton. Mm. And people said, no, this is not gonna happen. So they engaged in civil disobedience, kind of the classical American tradition, uh, maybe not as popular as it once was, but slowly repopularizing. And they blocked the trucks. Trucks never got in. Right. And this, this blockade set up new ideas. And from that new idea, uh, not only did environmental justice come about, but we see the rise of environmental racism. Absolutely. Who bears the burdens? And let me say this before you go on is if y'all notice in that picture on the right hand side, that young lady, how young she is, that's how I started off with activism and being involved and being engaged with land issues. I was probably by her size and almost had that same hairstyle. Okay, so people think that, you know, it's always somebody when they get in their midlife or they've retired now and they have no threat to their job to get involved. Not true. Most of the movements have been started by the children, as we would say, the children and things like that, because they're brave enough to get out there and take a stand. And if you're not brave at that time, a lot of times it ain't going to change later on either. All right. So you get too settled in and you don't have that energy anymore. So I just wanted to make sure that as much as you're looking at the people laying on the ground, don't miss her standing because that's what this is all about is standing. Go ahead. And, and yeah, in so many ways, this is civil rights meeting environmentalism in this uh, Absolutely. huge way. And it had such a big impact. It's changed the whole world. This small event set off so many ideas. And uh, I had the privilege of going back for the 50th celebration of Afton's uh, EJ protest and movement. And I was surprised most of the community still alive because so many of them were kids at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're still around, they're still fighting. They're at the forefront of the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. They're doing amazing things still to this day. So uh, for those who think that you're either too young or, or too old or any, this, that, or the other, the movement is, is comprised of a, a great diversity of age groups. Right, absolutely, intergenerational. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And so thinking about environmental racism, this, this concept not only took off, but I point back to Reverend Ben Chavis, uh, mm -hmm. who, who was a part of the Wilmington 10, a mm -hmm. huge Im impact on my life, uh, a, a very effective grassroots organizer, uh, reminds me in many ways of, of Reverend Barber and, yeah. and others. Uh, he was national president of the NAACP for, for two years or three years, uh, coined the term environmental racism uh, to emphasize intentionality, how these communities are intentionally targeted. Uh, and the term took off and it really got embedded at the University of Michigan, which then kind of took this and made it more of an academic concept. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because you have a movement and the scholars simultaneously meeting up over this idea. And then they don't credit him. And that's the bad part is typical of academicians, they will hear a wonderful quote. And if it's from a black person, they'll start using it, but they won't say who started using it. So this is outstanding here to actually see who was behind the terminology environmental racism, because I've long since known of Reverend Ben Chavis, but never knew he was the one that coined the phrase environmental racism. He's a He's a champion where, where I lived in Wilmington. We, we knew his name. Uh, and only one I got throughout the rest of the South, I realized that people weren't as familiar with this. And it was kind of homegrown uh, justice, if you will. Yes. Um, it's, it feels empowering to, to know that there are, are characters and individuals that we can look back to as informing the present moment. And he's still going strong. Yes, uh, he is. Yes. <laughs> that's a he's he's going to be fighting to the last breath. I, no, I look up to him. You know that's right. And so the concept was largely uh, transitioned with, with the work of uh, Dr. Bullard, kind of the father of environmental justice as he's oftentimes referred. Uh, and he, he really published a lot of uh, really influential works. 
Um, his 1983 big one, uh, talking about solid waste sites throughout Houston. He did these hand-drawn maps, kind of a WB Du Bois approach. I'm really impressed with what he's done. Uh, but his big breakthrough work was uh, Dumping in Dixie, Race, Class, and Environmental Quality. Mm -hmm. if, if any of y'all haven't read this book, it is arguably one of the biggest classics in the area. Uh, and this one really took a regional focus on the South and about how the South has a different dynamic than the Northwest, than the Northeast. Uh, but these patterns then spread this concentration process. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Bullard is, is uh, still going strong as well. So we have two big names uh, at the forefront of the movement still, but he's more the academic wing. Gotcha. And so uh, from there, I, I just wanna point out that these two characters uh, and intellectuals, movement scholars, uh, on the one hand, we have the Chavis side of environmental justice, which is the social movement about fair burden or fair distribution of benefits and burdens kind of that very grassroots approach. Uh, and on the other, we have the, the interdisciplinary body of social science research about concepts of justice, governance, planning, development, politics, and planning. And so we have these two that have kind of been complementary in many ways. The, the people who study it with their big grants and the University of Michigan, who's done all this great research, and then those communities fighting at the front line. And I, I know that oftentimes we, we separate these two things out, but I think that they're more in sync than we oftentimes give them credit. Mm -hmm. And so this is the wealth of research that's been produced over the last 30 years. Uh, really- oh, yeah. You and your word clouds. He loves word clouds, y'all. He's got me doing them now. I've been using them this year. I love this now. <laughs> I'm, I'm a visual learner. So I, I really like bringing uh, kind of the, the wealth of research. We got the red classical notion studies of justice. You got the demographics of who gets targeted over in the blue. You got yellow up at the top with kind of more the law legal schools studying how do we enforce these things and make environmental justice a reality at the, the state level. And then at the bottom, you kind of see landscapes and how does planning play in? Who, who gets to make these decisions of what is fair burdens? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not gonna get into all of these, but rather uh, the keyword cloud here, environmental justice is our heart. It is the hot spot at the center, all of it. Uh, you see mental health and, and health immediately tied to it with disproportionate exposure to risk. You see race being directly tied to that. Uh, justice, sustainability, and climate change, kind of classical environmental uh, topics and ecosystem services, and regulation, and procedural justice over here to the, to the left. But you see uh, disaster vulnerability to the, uh, to the lower part of it as well. So looking at this, we actually see that EJ's really more like a tree with many branches. I think it's, it's more helpful to not think of it as a singular monolithic thing, but rather different directions that are growing and changing with time. And they're only being compounded, as you said, with the current stresses of living in a pandemic and not having health insurance, things like that, that especially BIPOC communities suffer the most with dealing with. And so this is really, interesting to see it and love the color scheme that you chose for it as well. It really highlights it because the red is right there central, like the blood of the people is in jeopardy because of environmental justice in all its forms and with all of its branches. And, and one of my colleagues up at, uh, I believe it was Duke, did a study recently and found that as people are, are staying home due to COVID, the number of uh, pollution reports has skyrocketed throughout all states. And that's a result of people just being more observant because they're not as busy. These yeah. things have always been there, but we're reporting them now because we're not as stressed running around and doing all these things. And people are, are have the time to, to put in this work. Uh, so it's, it's definitely, COVID has changed EJ in many ways. And, and so uh, here, I wanna see. And so the first concept uh, I bring up is slow violence. Uh, not Richard Nixon, but rather Rob Nixon out of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, um, talking about environmentalism of the poor, uh, really going back to that classical Rachel Carson way of thinking and Silent Spring and how pollution slowly creeps in, not over a day. It's not a, a BP oil spill. We're talking about a slow poisoning over decades and how each decade takes off another five years of life. And so to, to quote uh, Nixon, we are accustomed to con conceiving violence as an immediate explosive erupting into instant concentrated visibility, but we need to revisit our assumptions and consider the relative invisibility of slow violence, 
I mean violence that's neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but instead incremental. Calamitous repercussions are postponed for years or decades or centuries. I think this concept speaks volumes to whether you're talking about the paper mills south of Savannah, or you're talking about Gen X and, and the Cape Fear River. Uh, many of these things are, are oftentimes unseen. We didn't even know about the Gen X contamination until uh, five years after the whole process had started. This was a slow accumulation. And so going on with this, uh, climate change falls in this category, toxic drift of, of pesticides in the fields, deforestation, oil spills, uh, this is oftentimes a, a gradual, invisible, we're, we're still feeling BP down on the Gulf. We're still feeling uh, many of these larger industrial disasters. Uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, we still feel the rough air quality, even though many of the regulations passed have gone into effect over two decades ago. And so this attritional lethality, how it accumulates, it's, it's not spectacle, it's hard to see. But how do we fight for, how do we fight something that we can't see? And I think that's the real challenge at play here. And that's always the big issue, right? Because people can easily try to deny that which is not physically represented. Like you can't just look at it and say, this is it. So when we say things, especially in the environmental movement, you're talking about having to have scientists prove the truth that you already have within your body. Like you said with PFAS, you go to a doctor that's not familiar with environmental issues and they're just trying to think, well, maybe you need a psychiatrist. What do you mean you're scratching? What do you mean you're waking up with nightmares? They're not taking into account that, no, this is something real. Okay, they draw blood. Now your blood looks different. Now it's like, oh, but I don't, I don't know what to do with this, you know, because it's not diabetes, it's not something like that, and they don't know what to do. So now you end up where people try to make this even what you're making visible by your very presence and your very voice. They try to make it invisible again by saying, well, no, it's in your head. It has yeah. to be in your mind, you know, you're, you're, you're somebody who just, maybe you just want some medications or something, you know, and they're not getting it that no, this is a real thing. So again, that's a violent act against you yeah. because psychologically they're trying to make you think you're crazy for the experience you're actually living. In, in Wilmington, I saw uh, six doctors about this, this uh, exposure that my family had experienced. And they said, oh, exposure induced psoriasis. You got something on your skin that led, made this happen. Uh, one doctor said it's in your bloodstream, but when I went to when I went to speak with a, a French uh, doctor, they said, "Oh, you've been poisoned." Mm. Two very different ways of thinking about the same they thing. Are. Oh, you're you're exposed, and the other was, "No, no, you've been you've accumulated something in your body over a decade." Wow. And I I think that maybe that's why this concept jumps out. It's the first one I bring in because this is exactly what I see happen in Wilmington and other other coastal communities. We we get the runoff from upstream. We yeah. don't decide what's up in the mountains in the That's Piedmont. Right. That's right. That's we right. never had a chance. That's right. But we get it downstream. And, and love thy downstream neighbor is a great thing from the Bible, but we don't see many of these legislators acting like that. You know, that's right. Because their, their thing is, and God we trust while they're looking at the dollar bill reading it, and, and we don't know what God they mean. Is it with the big G or the little G? You got me? <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead. If, if only they, the God they were trusting in was, was the love downstream neighbor one, I think we'd be having a very different environmental very different arrangement. Absolutely. We wouldn't have to bring out the word justice so often because justice would be what we were all living, right? Exactly. There we go. And so uh, I'm not going to get too far into this, but the, the idea of, of talking about environmentalism of the poor, the disempowered, the, the vulnerable, uh, and how this drives conflicts. I mean, that's how the EPA got created. And I think we need to see another revival of this type of beyond market logic. The market created these poison problems. The market did a lot of these things, but the, the life-sustaining systems that we rely on need to be prioritized. And whether that be the fish that, right. that we eat along the coast. I mean, yeah, they talk about mercury concentration, but what about heavy other heavy chemicals? What about arsenic? Right. Right. What about chromium? What about these heavy, these other ones that concentrate? We don't see the right fisherman's right to know. No, we don't see that. 
and PCBs and the various other things. You mentioned PFAS earlier, all mm -hmm. of these things that we've actually found are in waterways, especially the closer you are to urbanized areas in the Gullah Geechee Nation. So when we're talking about Wilmington, we're talking about Charleston, South Carolina, we're talking about Jacksonville, Florida, we're talking about Savannah, Georgia, you are talking about communities that are in, in Brunswick, Georgia, you are talking about communities who have been inundated with super fun sites. And those super fun site examinations are often on land, but like you're saying, what's also in the water now? what's in the water and then how has that affected the local water table when you have communities like you said downstream that are rural that now we have hand pumps and we still pump water and we drink that water from the pump we use that water to bathe with from the pump we don't just wash cars which you might not own no car to be washing you see what i'm saying so what happens then what's the domino effect of all of this you see or what is the ripple i should say effect of all of this and who ultimately gets hit with the big wave like you showed at the beginning yeah you cut one strand in the web of life and suddenly you have reverberating butterfly effects through the whole thing absolutely and in a we see coal ash accumulating in Jacksonville, Florida, and they had a victory there to relocate that coal ash. But sure enough, they went and put it in a rural panhandle. They were shipping it down I-10 to another poor, low-income, rural, oftentimes uh, Black, Latino neighborhood. So a victory in one place, downstream can mean many things, literally in the stream or downstream in terms of the flow of toxins. It's a, a, a dark double metaphor there. Absolutely. And it also flows downstream in terms of from up the hill, the hill flowing downstream to the rest of the folks that don't have the political clout and the power that they oh, have. Oh, Florence bought a lot of pig waste down in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And so I, I transitioned to my second topic here, green criminology. And I love this topic. This is uh, where I've had most of my uh, focus over the last two years. And green criminology went to philosophy. These, these criminologists studied EJ and then said, we need to go back to philosophy and look at the types of harm that have been omitted. The invisible is just one, but the, the, not only the indirect forms of harm, but say you cut down a forest 20 years from now, those benefits of a sustained forest aren't gonna be around for the next generation. Right. We often talk about seven generations from now. So they're thinking in, in larger philosophical definitions, Lynch, Strateski, uh, oftentimes many of them are down in Florida, Others are uh, now moving to Australia to look at these types of things, but uh, green crime flips the idea of justice on its head. So not as, it's not just Buck War dumping PCBs along the highway, it's the corporate system that enabled the creation of the PCBs, made money off of it, and then made money off dumping it. It's the whole structure that's in, implied as a, a largely uh, in the criminal process. You can't you can't separate the creation from the dumping. Right. And so looking at green crime, they say not only was EJ so successful from 94 up until through the Obama administration, getting many of these things uh, enacted in law, but they said the, the legal structures have been transformed by this movement. Mm -hmm. And so the courts largely replaced the, the movements in the streets. We don't see frontline communities getting voiced as much. We see people interviewing judges on the nightly news. Right. That's a big shift. Yes, it is. And so the struggle for equity it did move to the courts, uh, at least for many years. But then these last four, it seems to have gone back to the streets, if you ask me. We've seen a lot of environmental justice kind of classical uh, frameworks return as a result. But this, the notion of justice needs to be put on the corporate actors doing these things and the state agents that allow it. So, so say you have a company dump in something like Gen X. They get a fine and they're just going to pay the fine as a cost of doing business. That's it. That's it. That's it. They write it right off. It's already built in to what they plan to build. Mm -hmm. They just see it as a cost of doing business. So that means the EPA is not doing their job because it's not hard enough of a slap on the wrist. We got to upgrade these. If, if you're committing a crime, you need to serve your time. Serve I mean, time. exactly. You commit the crime, you need to serve time. Yeah. And that, and not in um, a resort jail either exactly i mean gen x they just got a slap on the wrist and they kept dumping they, they, they didn't even pause right and so i'm not only mad at the company producing gen x and dumping it i'm mad at the actors of the epa not pushing this far enough to put them out of business because they cannot do this 
absolutely. I agree 100%. And the other thing that I don't like is that the environmental justice meetings where I presented, there was a lot of discussion about remediation, but remediation of these types of um, Superfund sites in a manner that converts them to golf courses. So now we're going to compound the problem even further <laughs> by now putting that there, either making it a golf course or making it a shopping mall was the other ones they were doing. So now let's draw people. Well, it's not healthy enough for you to live here, but we'll draw you over here for these activities. And now we want to say we're helping the community because we're going to go to local schools and we're going to give money through the PGA to a golf program for the children. But notice who gets the golf over there? The people who already polluted and poisoned and stuff. It's not these other people who you're going to see on your television when they're playing these games. They come from my county, Beaufort County, and, and they're broadcast around the world. It's not going to be those guys. But now you've displaced the community. You've poisoned the rest of that community. And now you want to make money on top of it by putting a shopping mall there so then it's not healthy enough to live but it's healthy enough for y'all come give us some more money the little bit of money you got left over after you pay them doctor's bills come on shop and and we see the same thing in appalachia they blow up a mountain completely cut the top off it heavy yeah. metals everywhere people have to relocate and then they build a shopping mall where this community once reside in the, the appalachian hollow so right. i mean they they same ecological sacrifice zones turning into strip malls, it, we see it everywhere. I mean, you look out in Oklahoma, you look out in Arizona, the nuclear testing facilities, uh, the chat piles in Oklahoma. Yeah, it's, it's a tragedy. And yet I, I think the green criminology does a great job saying you can't, you can't benefit off of this in the way you are. The whole structure needs to be re-examined. Where is injustice if, if supposedly those enforcing it are also participating in it? Absolutely right. And so green crime, I think, is going to continue to grow. Uh, we see new programs at universities in green crime, uh, looking at these types of harms, uh, looking at the intersection of intentionality versus accidental problems, who's at fault, uh, the flipping of this concept, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, and a whole new subcategory. We have new types of criminologists now, and I think that's very interesting. Green victimology, what is it like to be a victim? What's it like to wake up screaming from a uh, poisoned well? What's it like to be a legal scholar making new arguments in this field? I'm really interested to see what comes out of critical race research as it intersects with environment as well. Mm -hmm. And then these legal definitions, it's a, it's a great thing. I think it's given us a lot because I could go look up who's a green criminal in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it's a little limiting if we're only gonna limit our notions of harm as something that's proven by law. Because we've, as we've known before, many of these crimes get away if you can't prove it. Absolutely. And so here's a map I made, uh, an article that called Green Crime Havens came out last year of the South. North Carolina has more water issues than I can count. Mm. Uh, the red dot, uh, the blue dots are, are water. Uh, mm -hmm. The light blue dots are air and red is RCRA, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, heavy toxins on land. Mm -hmm. And uh, I apologize for the bold outline, but we would actually see the, the paper mills south of Savannah have a cluster there too. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, many people don't pollute on the coast as much as they would because of the, the, out, the arrival of resorts and things like this. But many of these things are going to run to the coast. That's why you see Mobile Basin. I mean, Cancer Alley in Louisiana is a nightmare. True. Houston. Mm. So... Yeah. We can now map these things, which is great of having a legal definition, but we gotta go beyond it. We gotta push harm into these uh, invisible harms. So we gotta, we gotta look at that slow violence in the form of green crime. Mm -hmm. We also see uh, ecocide now arriving at the UN uh, international discussion, discussions, coming up with new definitions of what does it mean to kill a whole ecosystem and those who rely on it. So I think green crime has made a very big impact in the last 10 years uh, from the grassroots level to the global. Mm -hmm. And now I arrive to uh, Dorsetta Taylor, uh, uh, a strong uh, black woman out of Yale, has changed the game in an incredible short period of time. And she introduced the concept of environmental privilege, about the ability of privileged groups to keep environmental amenities, the things you enjoy, like parks. Central Park was put over 
an all black part of town uh, and was able to deny groups access to these things because those green uh, amenities essentially pushed them out. We also see this in Chicago, we see it out in LA. Uh, anytime someone says, oh, we're gonna do something sustainable, well, where's that part gonna go? Well, not only that, it takes on a different form here with these same gated areas. These gated areas then block people from the resource of the ocean. So they have this privatization of beaches, which is again, racializing the space. It is a form of spatial racism to then come in and gate people off from accessibility points to water. So again, it takes different forms in different places. And trust me, I love Central Park, but when I found out the horror story and I said, oh, no wonder I was always drawn to Central Park. I lived near Prospect Park when I lived in New York, but was more drawn to Central Park. And I said, no wonder this was black folks land. It was a whole black township before it was a wonder. The spirit called out to me that that was a place I would go to try to sit and relax along water, being an island girl to get that feeling. But once again, you look at the multi-million dollar co-op co buildings and condominiums all along that surround it too. So again, that privilege takes many forms and how it's used in regard to using the environmental resources. Exactly. And last time I went to Hilton Head, I couldn't even find a publicly accessible place. I, I didn't get to visit the beach because I couldn't access any of them. I believe uh, it. And, I and there's only one point left and you got to be able to find it. It's like a needle in a haystack. It's, it's like going on the internet trying to search how can I access this environmental beautiful thing that's, I mean, it was owned by Gullah Geechee and then the push out now privatized and who can access only if you have that pay stub for your hotel room. Mm -hmm. We see this all over the world now and how conservation ideas and not to throw Teddy Roosevelt under the bus here and John Muir and the like, but you look at something like, uh, I mean, Big Sur, it was protected so white people could go there. Right. That's a privilege. Right. And, and we, we see this even if you look at Mount Rushmore, uh, an ancestral uh, yeah. place for many Native Americans became a white privilege access. And this, it's, it's really bizarre how this whole thing's played out and how conservation and green ideas got co-opted to, to be used as a tool for racism. racism. And I think that's what uh, Professor uh, Dorsetta Taylor does so well. Mm -hmm. And so now I arrive, Queen, to, to your concept, and I, uh, please which jump in. Which we've been illustrating the entire time, right? Exactly. Uh, destruction, and there you go, there it is. That's Hilton Head, I see it. I see the little light tower there um, and all of that stuff. So definitely this term I came up with because of this place, because of this space here in Beaufort County, South Kakalaki, you're in the Gullah Geechee Nation. I'm in the exact, same place. Look at that picture. Now look at the background with me, like that commercial. Now look at that. Now look at me. Now look at that. Now look at me. All right. So here you see the juxtaposition. I'm on St. Helena Island. That now is Hilton Head. Hilton Head used to look like where I am on St. Helena Island in the past, let's say 35 years, um, we started seeing this proliferation of this type of destruction myth. And I came up with the term destruction myth in my book, The Legacy of Evo Landing, Gullah Roots of African-American Culture. You can get it at gullahgeechee.biz. Yes, he just held it up. Go ahead, held, hold it up again, Dr. Taltra. There you go, yes. You can get it at gullahgeechee.biz and read specifically about why I referred to Hilton Head and this being a precursor to the destruction meant and displacement for Gullah Geechee's, which is part of a genocidal attack of removal. And so now I love hearing this too about ecocide because that's what they've done. They have tried to market themselves as being environmentally friendly because they don't cut down all 100 acres of trees. <laughs> you only gonna cut down 90%, you know, and that kind of thing to build golf, to make golf courses, which need chemicals okay, to stay green all year. And then you're going to build what you all are looking at. And then we're going to block out those of you who can't afford to get in. All right. So that's the kind of thing that destruction is about, that if you are coming into a community, things are already there, but you need to bring in bulldozers, then that means you are destroying something. You're not developing anything. 
you're destroying something. You are extracting things out that were naturally there, including the people who were indigenous to that land. But as we done tell and chill and a thing like that for now, we the been young, we not going to with tall, tall. So we do right here and we not going. No. Yes, I saw y'all pop up in the chat. Somebody mentioned the word gentrification, right? Which takes on a totally different form here. Um, and it is just all out displacement. Used to be called urban renewal. Then we learned it was Negro removal. And, and gentrification is oftentimes framed in a, an urban context. Right. But before the arrival of this, this was a pretty rural Gullah Geechee black township. Absolutely. And I think when you take a rural area and change it into something like this, it's almost like rural gentrification. But I think that's the strength of destruction in so many ways. It's, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a city. Or it could be a black township that's relatively small that also gets transformed into something like this. Absolutely. And so... Queen, jump in at any point. This is your idea. So I'm just, as I understand it here, uh, development and destruction as a portmanteau term. Uh, this is from two years ago, Coastal, Coastal Cultures Conference. Real big impact on myself. Uh, a portmanteau. Since you went on, did your whole thesis on it. Obviously, it had some level of impact on you. <laughs> I threw every other chapter out the window once I read this, this uh, short piece. Um, it's a chapter. It's not a big piece. Uh, here in the middle of the book. Yeah. And uh, I'll read the first, first line if I might. Mm -hmm. The words development and developer ring hollow in the sea islands of the United States of the Americas and brings on images of family removal and the breakdown and dissolution of cultural ties. And so development laying waste to not only the cultural, but also the physical ecosystems and recognizing these harms. So I think that you've done a great job here picking up on what the green criminologists are trying to do and look at harm in its abstract, less perceived, less observed and, and push that, it in that direction. Yeah, and less discussed and less dialogued term. Definitely, definitely, yeah. And so the, these developers are, are as, you've, as I've heard you describe them, destructionaires. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not only removing the, environment and the beauty of this, this ancestral place, but they're taking away the historical legacies in doing so. You can't, you can't find a celebration tree over there anymore. They're cut Ward 1 right in half, developed right. it into private gated communities. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, 70% of the islands now gated community. You can't even visit them. Right. And then many of them with the word plantation still in their name. And as you know, we protested this year to have all of them remove the word plantation from their names. Most of them did it. Hilton Head Plantation said something like, oh, no, that would cost too much for us to change the name and all of this and change signage. Cost too much after you have economically exploited everything in this region, every human being, every type of wildlife creature, every tree, anything that was manageable to be exploited, you've done that for financial purposes. And you now are going to tell us that you don't have enough funding to simply go through a process to remove a sign that's on the main highway as people enter that island. It is a disgrace. And that's why I have never encouraged anyone to come to the Gullah Geechee Nation and spend money on Hilton Head Island unless they were going to a Gullah Geechee owned restaurant, which there are no more of on that island now, or they were going coming over for what used to be the Native Island the Gullah celebration, which that got altered once the town put their money in there. It's something else. It's more, it's totally different. Um, and so, and it's not called Native Island the Gullah celebration anymore either. It's now called the Hilton Head Island Gullah celebration. So as soon as they linked that name on it, it became what they wanted and how it would be directed, which of course would not tell this narrative of destruction, man, which would not tell the narrative of displacement, which would not tell of the continued horrors and things that families write me about where they're losing land, legally losing land in court because these lawyers are in bed with the judges and other things and then they lose their case where they also have actually had families who were threatened, lives threatened for their property. They don't want that narrative to be told. So where I presented there for years, they stopped bringing me in after the name change because I would tell it all, you see? And so others still 
grasp the concept. Why would you go there? Like Black family reunion parties, they go there because they're thinking we want to be in a resort atmosphere and we want to be right on the beach, but they don't understand then blood is on your hands. The dollar that you had just exchanged for your change, you brought back a piece of Gullah Geechee flesh on it. That's what you did. And so if you are another Black person and you want to promote yourself as having gone there, I'm not impressed by that because you're not assisting the Gullah Geechee's with the continuation of our culture and our community and our traditions by you celebrating a Western form of what makes you believe that this is a beautiful place. The Sea Islands is a beautiful place without anybody building anything because God made it that way. So when we start doing this, how beautiful do you think it is when the hurricanes come though and all those boats that you just saw in that marina are piled up on each other and thrown up on land? It ain't pretty then. Nobody wants to come down here then and help us clean it up. Nobody wants to deal with somebody else's boat capsizing off of a piece of one of those destruction and homes that then fell into the water. Like right now we have legal cases going on against Harbor Island, another gated area, because they've had houses fall in the water. And once they fall in the water, nobody wants to take responsibility for them. Nobody wants to take ownership for that, that now you are harming the environment. And again, it's your crime, you should do some time. Because if we have somebody around here that was a native Gullah Geechee that had some property fall in some water, you can best believe the county would then send them a letter first. And then next they would threaten to put a lien on their property until they clean it. And then the next thing you know, they're going to fine them. And then if they don't pay the fine, they're going to get a bench warrant. Why do I know this? Because I know someone who now is, is deceased, God bless the dead, but was in jail because he had a mobile home, couldn't afford to finish repairing it. Others who were Anglo people that moved in, kept bypassing it, ended up reporting it to the county. The county sent a letter. He could ignore the letter because he, what does he do? He doesn't have money to repair it, and they, but it's on his property. He owns the property outright. He owned the trailer outright. Well, the next thing we know, he's missing. Where is he? Where is he? Called downtown. They have him in jail because he did not pay a fine that the county levied only because he could not fix windows and this door on a mobile home. So these are the kind of things that end up happening that racialize it and why this is a destructive element when these people come in. Once they invade your region and then want to reset the laws, this is the kind of thing that happens to the people who have been here while the people who have come here can buy a way out or they can keep their stuff maintained a certain way. But then when something happens to their stuff, they can ignore it and then play like, but we can't do anything about it. We can't afford it and then claim bankruptcy, but don't go to jail for not having cleaned up the waterways after their stuff damages it. So all of those are other elements that have grown into the destruction and practice since the writing of the legacy of Evo Landing. A lot more dynamics have gone on, but definitely get this book. It will give you great insights into the concept for sure. Like again, go to gullahgeechee.biz, gullahgeechee.biz and get this book and it will greatly help you to get some insights more into the concept. And the buildings in many ways are fast violence. They go up so fast every time I come back to the Sea Islands, it's another development, another Margaritaville or something. Uh, yeah, we do have that craziness now in, uh, <laughs> yeah, in Bluffton on its way to Hardyville. Mm -hmm. and, and not to get too far into this, but uh, for people interested, Ayers property via Wingfall versus Mobley, uh, we've seen legal land theft steal millions of acres of black land over the last 30 years. It's so incredibly fast that the USDA is now putting out reports about Ayers property and how to fight it. Uh, I don't want to go too far into this, but this legalized land theft system is terrifying how you can have your land taken right out from under you despite doing everything correct. Absolutely. And for all of you who are more interested in more about Ayers property, we recently had two different episodes and we're going to continue to have them every quarter on this broadcast. So again, go to gullahgeechee.tv, gullahgeechee.tv, and you can put in Ayers property Queen Quet, you'll see the episodes come up, Ayers Property zooming in, and you'll see the episodes with attorney Willie Hayward of the Ayers Property Law Center, and also the episode that we did about Black land, Black wealth, um, and with the attorney Clifford Bush 
the third. They both are native Gullah Geechee Ayers property attorneys. And so definitely make sure that y'all watch those because we know we got to kind of get ready to bring this episode to a close. So that's some homework that y'all can go do. Go ahead, Dr. Thompson. I, I get so excited about this. I could talk about this all day. Yeah. Uh, but real fast, my favorite, arguably one of my favorite things about destructionment is that it brings in material reality and ideas and doesn't get hung up on idealism versus materialism. It talks about both and how they dialectically interact. So um, the material construction of a, of a new gated community begins with the ideas of best use practices in the law and in the courts. That best use practices comes from a material reality of, well, best use is largely defined by who's using it and who gets to use it and to what ends. So I think that this is a, one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to this concept. Um, and in thinking through it, uh, the slow violence that comes years after is, I mean, you, you put in a new gated community, that's gonna go over the marsh. That marsh is not gonna be able to serve as a breeding ground for fish the next year. So you're bringing down the fish supply, you're bringing down the ability for ecosystems to reproduce themselves. Right. And so here's Hilton Head, I had to bring in the gift. Yes, uh, I'm glad you did, yes. We can see Ward 1 get cut in half, and you just see the development come in rapidly, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the airport getting expanded there at the very end. Uh, sea Island Parkway there towards the bottom getting expanded. You also see it on the south part of the island, Disney's new developmental resorts from the 30s and 40s. Uh, if anyone has any questions or anything about this, please feel free to message me and let me know. But, but to keep moving, because there are another uh, more ideas I want to share real fast. The globalization of environmental justice has been huge, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. So we win a victory here in the United States along the, say, near St. Helena. Many of those same companies are going to relocate somewhere else in the world and do the exact same thing there. So we need to be thinking on a global level. Just because they don't get away with it here in the United States and we view them as green criminals, well, they're just going to go do it in the Niger Delta or in India or the Philippines. So this relocation, a race to the bottom, if you will, uh, really just pushes, we have one success here, well, that means something changes there. Well, and, and to think of the reverse direction, you put a protest on here in the United States about something a company's doing in the Niger Delta, like Shell, boy, they change their image real fast because this is where they make their money. Mm -hmm. So we can think of ourselves as a part of a global environmental movement uh, to help those that these new burdens have relocated to. There's that famous uh, New York, uh, what is it? Wall Street Journal. What, do you, what happens when you recycle something? You burn it, bury it, or send it on a Caribbean cruise and send it down to Haiti. Mm. So we make one success here. It's just going to go somewhere else. And I think we need to think of ourselves as a, a global movement trying to challenge this race. Absolutely. And so looking ahead, just real fast, uh, EJ and the new administration, I'm very optimistic. If we can put some Reverend Barber types, poor people campaign types into these positions, bring back the Mustafa Ali's, I think we would be doing much better than we are now. Bring in some ideas from Dorsetta Taylor would be amazing. Yes. Critical Environmental Justice by David Pello is pushing these philosophically in new directions, looking at the intersections of movements like Black Lives Matter with the environmental movement and new avenues for that. Uh, looking at prisons as an environmental burden. Uh, and then the international dimensions, as I mentioned. Uh, so we have four years ahead of us and a lot to accomplish, a lot to move through. Um, I'm very optimistic about what we can accomplish, especially at the grassroots level, uh, the academic level, and at the court level. These things are inseparable. And with that, those are, those are all the things that have me excited. Excellent. Excellent. Well, all that presentation, if it doesn't excite everybody here, I don't know. I'm going to just start a prayer line um, for the folks that need to get excited, because if you truly love the environment, then I would think that all that Dr. Thompson has shown us would excite you, would inspire you, would allow you to want to get engaged and get up, get involved and get into it. And I have loved this set of folks that's here with us today, Dr. Thompson, because my folks that are here live with me on Wednesdays, sometimes they're real quiet until the end. And then at the end, I get hit with all of these. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But we've been getting thank you all through this broadcast 
all through it, people have been saying how much they've learned from this. And you did some, as usual, some outstanding geeking out. I loved uh, what you presented and the visual nature of it, the colors and everything that you chose to illustrate what is a very poignant topic a very necessary topic that we have to do our due diligence to stay on top of. This is a topic that we cannot let slip by and all the other distractions as someone mentioned, we cannot let go of the term justice because we cannot let it just be just us anymore fighting for this, the communities that have been impacted, the families that have been impacted. It has to be global and we have to be proactive in ensuring that these companies will stop existing. If you polluted here, you shouldn't be existing in another country in the world. You need to be stopped because the people who are thinking that they can just do it wherever and colonize, overtake, pollute and then move, they need to be locked up, okay? So that this way, somebody else can come in that says, no, we're gonna clean up and we're gonna green up, all right? So that's the thing. So definitely take some time. Those of you who are interested, this is the book you've heard us talking about over and over today, The Legacy of Evo Landing, Gullah Roots of African-American Culture, which I edited. This was the first anthology. This is the second one. All right, We Be Gullah Geechee. This is Cultural, Capital, and Collaboration Anthology. Both of these I consider to be bookends because where Legacy of Evo Landing leaves off with destruction meant, We Be Gullah Geechee picks up and shows you ways to actually deal with keeping cultural heritage alive in these communities, starting, of course, with the framework of the Gullah Geechee Nation, how to do research collaboratively, respectfully, and competently, all right? Not to mention ethically. We hadn't yet used that word today, but that's the issue. We're dealing with ethics. I say I'm like this year, a mama and them ain't raised, I'm right, and thing like that, Eddie. Okay then. So if we were dear, yo, y'all better have a go and get a switch, a belt and thing like that, Eddie, because we ain't gonna tolerate all of this shit. All right. Now, like I often tell folks, crabs need to eat too. So there's another way to deal with some of the stuff going on. So they all know who I talk about Gullah Geechee's that year other day. All right. So I see a lot of folks. I see family here. I see family from Sandy Island here. Love you. Glad you here. See my usual folks, brother Anton, they had to stop in. A lot of folks, sister Adrian, our family from Uba, Uba in the motherland. She is here with us. She is, I am so glad that you are here. It is a blessing that all of us globally are gathered because this topic was of interest. You could have been doing anything else today. So because I appreciate all that you have done to support Zooming In on Sustainability, if you do go to gullahgeechee.biz, again, that's G-U-L-L-A-H-G-E-E-C-H-E-E.biz, gullahgeechee.biz, and purchase these books or any of the other books there about the Gullah Geechee Nation and the work we're continuing to do to sustain our culture in spite of the things that you've heard us discuss here today. Use the code Gullah Geechee Love, Gullah Geechee Love, when you check out and you will get a discount for all the items that you purchase. So it won't just be on the books. There are other Gullah Geechee handmade items. You heard me mention earlier that I'm proud of Dr. Thompson because he has put his hands into this, put his hands not only to protest signs, but put his hands to the plow and put his mind in it to use his know-how, to use the technology to continue to be part of a movement to bring about justice in the world. He could have used his white skin privilege to be on the other side side. He could have ended up working for the polluters, really. And I've seen it happen. I have seen people who say, well, oh, I'm environmentalist and I work for this environmental group and I meet them there. Then I wonder, well, where did they go? We don't see them anymore. We don't get emails from them. And then I find out at, an, at the next rally from somebody, oh, you didn't know they switched sides? They got a job and they switched sides on us. You see? So it happens. It is real. And that is something that we have still to contend with. So that's why I want to have people on this show that you know have the passion for what they're doing and so that you get their backstories to realize why. Why are these Buckra folk engaged in the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank? Because what Ryan Thompson can go in there and get, they ain't gonna give Queen Quit. Queen Quit might not even be able to get inside. They'll start Queen Quit at the porch and they ain't even about no COVID. 
talking about, oh, we ain't got no records of that. We don't, we don't have anything here like that. But he can go in and get them. And they wouldn't think twice about him asking for it. So what we don't just ask for, but demand is not only justice, but equity and equality. Those two words do not mean the same thing. People are throwing it around now. They talk about, oh, we're doing equity and inclusion. Equity and inclusion is not about equality either. And none of those terms just point blank mean dismantling racism. Because whether we're talking about environmental racism or any other term we put in front of it, the root word, the root of the problem, the root of the issue is racism. That's what all of this boils down to. And that's globally we're dealing with that matter. So it is up to each of you now that's been here today that say you've gotten so much out of this to take what you got and multiply it. Take it back into your communities, take it around the world and use these tools. I'm so happy, Dr. Thompson, do you have any words of inspiration or enlightenment that you wanna give to the audience to say what could help them go on? Cause you and I both know as activists that this and as me as the artist, this is not for the faint at heart, <laughs> okay? Cause you'll be fainting often <laughs> or you'll stop at the first rally, right? But so, and you'll, you'll definitely stop when they start threatening your lives because they do that all the time, all right? So definitely what words of inspiration or motivation might you want to share with the audience? Uh, at foremost, I believe we will win because yeah. the the long the long march to justice, that long arch, is, as Dr. King used to talk about, is, is in my view inevitable. And further, uh, yes, practice self care. It is very important, but especially looking to your peers, your your loved ones. Collective care is equally as important. So in these trying times, uh, build those new relations, build, build friendships, uh, co-conspirators, friends, uh, as Queen mentioned earlier, and, and build that world. It's, it's gonna take some marching, but I, I'm, I'm very confident from the work of Chavis to Queen Quet to uh, Dr. Taylor, the, all these things are coming together and pointing in the right direction. Excellent. And how will we point them in your direction? Do you have a Twitter feed? Do you have a website that you want to give out so people could follow you and your work and your trajectory that you're still on? Yes, uh, I do have a Twitter account, uh, Ryan Thompson with no P as it's spelled here, uh, but also uh, my university account here at the University of Auburn. Um, couldn't be happier to be a rural sociologist. Uh, and if you want to get in contact with me, uh, my email is rwt0012 at auburn.edu. Would love to, to chat or follow up on any of this material with y'all. Yes, excellent. And definitely you can drop your email in the chat as well for them to make sure they spell it correctly, but just follow him at Ryan Thompson on Twitter. And definitely you'll keep up with a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of activities about the ways to fight back be proactive and be active. But it's so interesting, you all heard me say earlier that this must be EJ day for me because I had just done a presentation with a class today, but yesterday Dr. Thompson invited me to come to Alabama by way of Zoom. And we actually did a destruction class with high schoolers, actually honors, honors uh, history students down there in Birmingham, Alabama. And it was wonderful to get the feedback that the students got so much out of my brief attendance in their class and us talking about it, sharing this concept. So it's a blessing to me that you're proliferating this concept, Dr. Thompson, I really appreciate that. And then today I had this opportunity to speak to college students. And the first thing that I did in that class was say the same thing that Dr. Thompson just told you, and he had no idea because he wasn't in there, that self-care is critical in this work. Everything about Gullah Geechee life and culture is about living in balance. And so I call it having a wusa moment. And so that you find that place, you find that space, you find that energy, that you can tap into that centers you, that brings you peace. If you want to walk along the water and breathe it in, well, you got some nice, fresh, clean air, like what we're fighting for. 
If you go and you're that person that loves to like me to listen to music and dance and sing, you might need to do that. Or as I told the students today, if you literally have to act like you Superman and you can't find a phone booth no more, but you can go ahead and get in a closet, people might think you have lost it by getting in that closet, but actually you're getting in that closet so you don't lose it. And when you get in there, meditate, scream, pray, do what you need to do so that when you step back out here in the world, you're back in balance. You're back in that wusa. You're back in that om. You're back in that peace. You're back in that shalom. In totality, you want that peace to fill your place, your space, your energy, because that's how you build longevity. That's how you can be in this for the long march to justice, the long road to freedom. But freedom is a road seldom traveled by the multitudes. So sometimes you think it's a lonely road. But I tell you, like our homeboy Jeff Floyd said, I found love on the lonely highway, the love of justice, the love of peace, the love of equity and equality I have found on this road. The journey has not been easy, but also a song I love to sing by the late Reverend James Cleveland, I Don't Feel No Ways Tired. And so I'm telling you now, get yourself a song, get yourself a dance, get yourself that place that you can woo saw and get yourself, you can't get out here now because of the pandemic or any of that to actually get to these beautiful places that you want to see in the world. That's why you got digital things, right? Get yourself some imagery and put that on the wall and make that the place that you look into every day and visualize yourself there while you breathe deeply. You breathe in the peace you want, breathe out the pollution, breathe in the healing, breathe out the pollution, breathe in the balance, breathe out the injustice, and let us march together. And as we say, work together, chillin. Don't you get weary. Great camp meeting in the promised land. So y'all continue to follow us at gullahgeechee.tv. Follow and subscribe there for free. Follow us at GullahGeecheeNation.com, GullahGeecheeNation.com, also the Gullah Geechee Nation Facebook fan page, and at Gullah Geechee on Twitter and Instagram, G-U-L-L-A-H-G-E-E-C-H-E-E, and if Hunter to look for me, find you on the QueenQuet.com, QueenQuet, Q-U-E-E-N, Q-U-E-T dot C-O-M, QueenQuet.com. And Hunter can crack your teeth with we and thing like that, that we and thing like that. Because they're a blessing for her chance for Zoom in with all of Hunter chilling. And I thank you, thank you that you taught them not robbery, but join me one more again right here on Zooming in on sustainability. Now let's go on on out here in the world and fight for more justice. Peace, blessings, safety, good health, and happy holy days to all of Hunter chilling. And remember, if you go to gullahgeechee.biz, use Gullah Geechee Love as your code because that's what we sending out to you and your family as we continue the march to justice. Don't let it just be just us, but let's get justice and equity and equality for all of us in the world. Peace and blessings, everybody.